All right, Father, here you go. Hi. Sorry, I had to step away for a second. I, the window was open and the, the loud things were happening outside. I beg your pardon. Happy Wednesday. All right. As we always do, let's begin with our prayer. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived by the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy will. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. Pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection. To the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Great. And today's Wednesday, so we're going to do our Wednesday prayer for St. Joseph, because it's the year of St. Joseph. To you, O blessed Joseph, do we come in our tribulation, and having implored the help of your most holy spouse, we confidently invoke your patronage also. Through that charity which bound you to the Immaculate Virgin Mother of God, and through the paternal love with which you embraced the child Jesus, we humbly beg you graciously to regard the inheritance which Jesus Christ has purchased by his blood and with your power and strength to aid us in our necessities. O most watchful guardian of the Holy Family, defend the chosen children of Jesus Christ. O most loving Father, ward off from us every contagion of error and corrupting influence. O our most mighty protector, be kind to us and from heaven assist us in our struggle with the power of darkness. As once you rescued the child Jesus from deadly peril, so now protect God's holy church from the snares of the enemy and from all adversity. Shield too each one of us by your constant protection, so that supported by your example and your aid, we may be able to live piously, to die in holiness, and to obtain eternal happiness in heaven. Amen. Great, did it, <laughs> super. All right, today we have an interesting feast day. It's the first holy martyrs of Rome. It's kind of a, uh, not a great story, but we'll get to it in a second. Historically, today is also the St. Paul day after yesterday's St. Peter day. So the feast was, it was always kind of both together, but the way that Peter and Paul like liturgically are celebrated is that if there is an emphasis on one, then there's immediately a, a another little thing about the other to make sure that it's both and. And since St. Peter and Paul day ends up being more a St. Peter and oh, by the way, Paul day than anything else, there's a whole other little feast, not a big one that would happen right after on the 30th. Anyway, so that's also up in the air. But Let's begin and dive in. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. O God, who through the grace of adoption chose us to be children of light, grant, we pray, that we may not be wrapped in the darkness of error, but always be seen to stand in the bright light of truth. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever, amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Isaac grew, and on the day of the child's weaning, Abraham held a great feast. Sarah noticed the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she demanded of Abraham, drive out that slave and her son. No son of that slave is going to share the inheritance with my son, Isaac. Abraham was greatly distressed, 
especially on account of his son Ishmael. But God said to Abraham, do not be distressed about the boy or about your slave woman. Heed the demands of Sarah, no matter what she is asking of you. For it is through Isaac that descendants shall bear your name. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a great nation of him also, since he too is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abraham got some bread and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. Then placing the child on her back, he sent her away. As she roamed aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba, the water in the skin was used up. So she put the child down under a shrub and then went and sat opposite him about a bow shout away. For she said to herself, let me not watch to see the child die. As she, as she sat opposite Ishmael, he began to cry. God heard the boy's cry and God's messenger called to Hagar from heaven. What is the matter, Hagar? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy's cry in this plight of his. Arise, lift up the boy and hold him by the hand for I will make of him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and then let the boy drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our responsorial, the Lord hears the cry of the poor. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. When the poor one called out, the Lord heard, and from all his distress, he saved him. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. Fear the Lord, you his holy ones, for naught is lacking to those who fear him. The great grow poor and hungry, but those who seek the Lord want for no good thing. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. Come, children, hear me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Which of you desires life and takes delight in prosperous days? The Lord hears the cry of the poor. Alleluia, alleluia. The Father willed to give us birth by the word of truth that we may be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you and with your spirit, a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus came to the territory of the Gadarenes, two demoniacs who were coming from the tombs met him. They were so savage that no one could travel by that road. They cried out, what have you to do with us, son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the appointed time? Some distance away, a herd of many swine was feeding. The demons pleaded with him, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of swine. And he said to them, go then. They came out and entered the swine and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea where they drowned. The swineherds ran away, and when they came to the town, they reported everything, including what had happened to the demoniacs. Thereupon, the whole town came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their district. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. This reaction of the people of the town is always a bit surprising to me, right? I mean, obviously the scripture hasn't changed since the last time I read this, but still, you know, like, gee, gee whiz, that's kind of a lot. That's, <laughs> they did, the Lord did something that was good. You know, we see it as good, but I don't know, sometimes pigs are better, I suppose. Anyway, this kind of idea is a very important one. And Obviously, it's one that the Lord is very much used to. Okay, so 
<clears throat> in the process of reading through the Abraham story that we have been. Yesterday, because it was the feast of Saints Peter and Paul, we skipped over the very kind of problematic and not very nice story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And since this is coffee, I am absolutely going to bring that up because this is a wonderful time to do so. Okay, so the story goes very, very simply. A city is destroyed and forever the God of the Old Testament is seen as a very bad, 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 bad God or something, but certainly very mean. So like that, that's, that's kind of really, really like one of the ways in which this is read very just plainly. And there, of course, there's a lot more going on to it than that. The reason why that story is there, if, if you don't mind me kind of talking about this for a second, has nothing to do with Sodom and Gomorrah per se. It's also like later on when like Jonah and Nineveh and Jonah is talking around like in X days, Nineveh will be destroyed and suddenly everyone began doing the penance thing. It actually, in both of these stories, it's not about the city. It's not about the people there. It's about something else. There's, there's another thread that's being mentioned and this is actually what the scripture is about. So if you remember from Monday, we heard this kind of very interesting like tease almost where God and Abraham are talking and Abraham says, but wait, if you find just X or X minus 10 or X minus 20 people who are good in this place, will you still destroy it? And of course God says, no. So the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah doesn't have anything to do with the cities or the place or the plain or the Dead Sea or the pillars of salt. So Lot's wife, the pillar of salt, that was in the story that we would have read yesterday in that part of Genesis. But actually it has to do with how the story ends as usual. So this kind of narrative, this kind of scripture will tell you very much what it's about. And the what it's about is this, the thus it came to pass, that's really how this begins. Thus it came to pass, thus it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he was mindful of Abraham by sending Lot away from the upheaval by which God overthrew the cities where Lot had been living. The story is about Abraham, even though he's not there present. Specifically, it's about the kind of relationship that God and Abraham have, regardless of what is going on in the other things or the motivations for it, or the reason why it's a good or bad thing, which is ultimately like, mm, it's, it, it happened. And that's kind of not what the point of the story is. It's actually about God and Abraham, specifically how God respected Abraham. And this is what we were reading about on Monday. And for this, therefore, the consequence is that because all these things happened, then we have to kind of assign blame somewhere. And so it's easy to blame. Well, they had it coming for them, those people in Sodom and Gomorrah, or God was pretty mean. That was kind of a lot. Or gee whiz, that wife of Lot, she's just a pillar of salt. Why on earth did that happen? So however you want to assign blame, the blame game has lots going on with the story that we skipped over yesterday. But it's not about that. It has nothing to do with whose fault it was. Rather, and everything to do with Abraham, and God and how they interacted. And the reason why is because, guess what? It's another iteration in that thing, which is the covenant that God makes with Abraham that then gets kind of supported by sacrifice and all of those other things. It's all part of this iterative thing that I was talking about last week. So here's how that iterative thing goes. God becomes the scapegoat. So later on, much later than this, after the Exodus, and kind of because of it, 
we're going to get a thing going on of how to worship God, especially at the time when we remember the time of the Exodus, the Passover, and how that works. And also how that also has to have something else going on, which forgives sinfulness and how the way in which like the covenant hasn't been quite full, you know, really respected by the, by the people who benefit from it. And so we get the day of atonement things that are going on. And so there has to be some kind of mechanism by which, and famously that's the scapegoat of the day of atonement. Now, that thing is meant to already kind of set up the idea that ultimately it's God who takes on the sins of the people and obliterates them. So why, if God does that now, was it not back then? Well, because there's another part to the story, which is the reason why the Abraham link is made so very clear and so emphatic is so that we who read it, who receive it, who are part of this whole thing, can remember exactly what is going on and why the Lord did this, ultimately, simply out of love for us first shown to Abraham in what his covenant would be. And of course, later on, we have another of these weird kind of mercurial moments that are these very arbitrary things, capricious even, when we have, you know, son being sacrificed on the mountain, except no. And this is exactly what we would get. I think we could get this story, I think tomorrow, except we don't have coffee tomorrow. Yep, that's the one. God put Abraham to the test <laughs> Thursday. He called out to him, Abraham. God said, take your son, Isaac, your only one whom you love and go to the Mount, to the land of Moriah, Mount Moriah. There you shall offer him up as a burnt offering on a height that I will point out to you. And again, what is this crazy story about? The same thing about what that trust is in the covenant. And again, Who's bad? I mean, like the blame game naturally comes up for us. Like, gee whiz, God, was that really necessary? Well, that kind of questioning obviously has no place. And that kind of assignment of blame, again, has no place. Like this is, this is very, very typically, this is like by definition, not where we should be treading. In just the same way. In the gospel today, the people in the town were like, gee whiz, Jesus, did you have to kill the pigs? So obviously it's, it's no surprise that those guys, those demoniacs freed of the demons are worth much more than a vast herd of whatever. That's, that's not that's not up for grabs. That's not even a question. Ultimately, I kind of hope that they did show also their worth, but there seems to be a moral of the story here. If it were a fable, the moral would be this, that no good deed goes unpunished. And ultimately, like whatever the Lord does is kind of by definition, somewhat good. You know, actually not more than, not just somewhat, but actually it is good. That's what, that's what good is, actually. Anyway, so <clears throat> from that perspective, let's step back a second. One of the things that often happens is that when uh, charity is done, something that is good is done for someone else, we do have an understanding that it should be secret and private, and not you know ostentatious or otherwise you know, blown to everyone in the world. And there's, uh, in fact, that's even in the gospel, that you know the, 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 the goodness that is done should be done not for the sake of praise. Okay, there's a funny, that's always struck me as a little bit funny because you know many of the best things, you never know really the quality or how it is or the effect of, even if you do talk about it and talking about it isn't some kind of magic trick that suddenly makes it ineffectual, not really. It's more like how you hang your hat on it. And like, aha, you see, I am a good person and all of you should know that. See, I've shown you. That's, that's what's to be avoided, clearly. But here's the other thing, frankly. Um, I think that most often 
the, the good things that people do, like that which is charity, someone will find a reason to show it to be bad. Like someone will, someone will find that thing and will be annoying because of it. It may seem like impossible to imagine, but you know, there are people in the world who like really, really, really don't like St. Mother Teresa and who complain about her, that she was actually really bad and pretty mean for keeping people in such a, you know, awful way and, you know, kind of prolonging suffering. And, and kind of weird things like that. There are people who think that way and who, who talk that way. And it's not just because like in our human nature, we're very, very good at finding all the little clouds and silver linings. But, you know, there are actually, first of all, there are differing opinions. And it's also a very human thing that blame should be assigned even when there's nothing particularly wrong that needs to have blame assigned about it. We're good at being mean that way. And there's kind of a, perhaps a natural meanness that whenever something good does happen, it has to be immediately kind of taken down. I think we all know how this works. This is something that is not foreign to us by any means. You know, especially if someone is successful then, obviously they must be, uh, you know, attacked in some way, for example. And even in things which are actually good, if someone is successful in charity, well, even more so, it is um, kind, of, it kind of like goes with the territory. It's to be expected. And, you know, anyone who thinks otherwise, I, I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to hope for, but it's also a little bit naive. If God can be blamed for a variety of things, which he does, then uh, it's kind of like goes along by extension that we should also be especially if it's something as simple as the Lord freeing some demoniacs from a nasty road by some nasty tombs and ending up with a bunch of dead pigs. The, the whole story is kind of bad, obviously. But again, we know, everyone knows that those guys who were saved are, which are worth much more than the cost by which they were saved. And it wasn't even essentially really God's fault. You know, it wasn't Jesus who put them in the swine. It was Jesus merely like, I don't have time for you, stupid demons. Do what you're going to do, but just don't do this. Go. That's kind of the, 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 kind of the, the, the perspective here, which is also an important one. Like, I am not in charge of what bad things you bad things are going to do, you know, Jesus is not in charge of making sure that the demons demon well. Obviously not. The demons are going to, you know, obviously do what they are going to do, and it's going to be awful. Of course it's going to be awful. But again, who is blamed? Jesus. So also, happens to be today the feast of the first martyrs of Rome. So this is an interesting story, one that you probably know, too, because it's like movie-worthy <laughs> or at least, you know, short story worthy. So it goes like this, around the year 60, Rome burns. And there needs to be someone to blame, uh, famously Emperor Nero, this is that story, um, doesn't want to take the blame. He was also at the time that this happened, I think like 27. So think about any, you know, rich, entitled, vain 27 year old guy that you may know do you think they want to take the blame for this nope nope they're not going to do that and so obviously <laughs> there has to be a scapegoat and the scapegoat was the christian community and these are the christians who were you know these are the uh disciples of the apostles this is that time and the manner of their death was awful this is also part of the story they were <clears throat> rounded up terribly tortured and uh, so I was reading the, 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 the story of it this morning, and I was trying to put together what all the words meant that were being used. Not that I use torture words a lot in Latin, but I'm trying to figure out what this word means, what this word means, what this word means, and something about being um, encaged and mutilated and then um, exposed to the elements with dogs 
<laughs> so it sounds like a terrible, a terrible thing that I just said there. And I, I don't know what that really means, but otherwise this is what we usually say is being fed to the animals, but not just in the kind of the usual kind of uh, Colosseum way, you know, not that that was actually a thing that happened a lot. It didn't happen a lot, but not there. In other places, yes, in different times. But anyway, usually like the, the thing that we have in our mind's eye, because we saw it in the movie once, isn't exactly what always happened. But in this particular case, something pretty awful, essentially something out of a horror film like we would see these days. Then also a bunch of them were put on sticks and lit on fire. And though, so you had Nero's living torches, that story. And then some of them were, cru were crucified. And that was kind of like the, the not very interesting part. So that's the story of the early more, uh, Roman martyrs, the proto martyrs of Rome that, you know, for doing really nothing were scapegoated. This is something that happened not infrequently. So uh, some years earlier, like about five years earlier, six, the uh, Jewish or two actually, Right then, like the same time, uh, but before Nero, uh, no, it was like 10 years. Okay, so Claudius was emperor who expelled the Jews from Rome. And at that time, the, the, like the, 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 the Jewish synagogue in Rome was already incredibly old. It had been there for essentially the entire time that Rome was there. So, you know, 800 years and they were all moved out because it's just, it's easy to do. It's capricious and mean and it's expected. And so you have to find a scapegoat sometimes and that's what happens. Anyway, so it's not exactly something new. It's not something that's particularly unique. Obviously it's pretty miserable. And so what does that leave for us? Well, clearly, you know, there's this unfortunate message, which is, yeah, you should kind of be okay with this, that people aren't going to like you just to begin with sometimes about some things in some ways. Second one, that especially if you do actually something good, people are going to maybe not like you even more. And then third, if you're successful in doing all these things and probably there, some people are going to really not like you. And that's not like a flaw. It's kind of one of those things, which is just hanging out in the ether, just always right there. If anything, isn't this also like the Cain and Abel kind of thing where in a very ancient way, someone did something good, someone was uh, saddened that they did something that was not as good. And so then suddenly you have a brothers killing each other. It's kind of there from the beginning. It seems like the most direct effect of original sin, actually. I mean, that's certainly how it's presented in scripture. And that's kind of a clear one, I think. So in all of these things, take courage and be stout hearted as it says elsewhere in scripture. And because like, of course it's going to happen. And so like, and then so what? And ultimately what do we care about people's opinions so much anyway? What are you gonna do? So even if the Lord is, uh, you know, complained at, for being bad because he is good, or otherwise given the blame of the good and very little of the praise that might be due, then we should also be very consoled and content. So when it comes down to it, <clears throat> I don't think that it's really possible to get away with that thing, which is to tell other people about the good works that you may, be, may or may not be doing, because ultimately it's, it's going to be kind of a little bit self-defeating anyway. And maybe the Lord is actually, in that case, merely reminding us that, you know, it may, you may think that people will suddenly like you more, but that's actually maybe not what's going to happen. So this isn't meant to be a downer. This isn't meant to be depressing. <laughs> but it is one of those times where, you know, just by the way, the scriptures do kind of line up in a way that should tell us something and remind us that it will ultimately also all be okay. I mean, they ultimately, they did kill Jesus for this. So that, that was a thing. Uh, but, you know, then the resurrection comes. That's kind of a, a miserable way of talking about the faith, but it's also true that even if that scapegoating goes on and, and is rather terrible, still the Lord is the Lord and not just merely someone who survived, but God himself who promises also these graces to us.
Okay, pretty complicated, I'm sorry. As we always do, let's bring our prayers together now and offer them to the Lord that he will hear and answer us. For our Holy Father, Pope Francis, for our Bishop Oscar and for all bishops, that in their challenging moments, they may find strength in the Holy Spirit and comfort from the flock they shepherd. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the Catholic Church, that it be the bastion of hope for this world and the beacon for all souls seeking truth and love. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For God's people throughout the world, that any divisions existing between us disappear as we move closer to Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our parish, that as we celebrate the sacred heart of Jesus this month, our own hearts become inflamed with love of him. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the faithful departed, that they receive the reward to look upon the face of God. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For whom or what else shall we pray? Through the intercession of St. Monica for all our friends and family, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Gathering all our prayers into one, let us offer them in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who consecrated the abundant first fruits of the Roman church by the blood of the martyrs, grant, we pray, that with firm courage, we may together draw strength from so great a struggle and ever rejoice at the triumph of faithful love. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever. Amen. I always like that prayer for the first martyrs of Rome because it's like the triumph of love. It's, it's remarkably innocent. It kind of like the idea of it. It sounds like a, like a musical or something, but it's also a, a very serious story. Anyway, all these good things every day. Let's keep praying. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, the eyes of mercy toward us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. O God, our refuge and our strength, look down in mercy on your people who cry to you. And by the intercession of the glorious and immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of God, of Saint Joseph, her spouse, of your blessed apostles, Peter and Paul, and of all the saints, in mercy and goodness, hear our prayers for the conversion of sinners and for the liberty and exaltation of our Holy Mother and Church, through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Saint Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Great, good times. So we'll be back together again on Saturday. Have a, have a great you know, Thursday and Friday, and we'll see you again for the weekend. All right. God bless. Bye-bye.